With me tonight, my good friends Rachel Maddow and Lawrence O'Donnell, host of The Rachel Maddow Show and The Last Word right here on MSNBC. Rachel, I will say something. I am mad at myself for how surprised I was. <laughs> I was mad at myself as, as the time clicked, went by the two and a half weeks, I and I think a lot of people thought, and this was with informed speculation by people I respect, people who've clerked on the court, people who've been around the court, studied the court, know the court, there is no way they could take two and a half weeks only then to say we're taking the case seven weeks from now. What was your reaction to the order today? I mean, I don't think you should be mad at yourself. I don't think you should be embarrassed. I think everybody sort of thought that was the only kind of decent explanation for how long they were taking, that they were going to not take up the case, that maybe Samuel Alito or one of the other real MAGA judges was going to be really mad about it, was going to write an angry dissent, was biding for as much time as he could because this was his last chance to insert delay, which, of course, is what Trump wants. I think that was, you know, if you think about the, the court, as the Supreme Court of the United States and a rational actor and a decent one, that was a reasonable supposition, and it just turns out they're not that. Um, and Chris, I, f I feel you in terms of the emotion that you're bringing to this right now um, and the, the sort of sense of urgency with which you're underscoring what this means. It's, it's true. There isn't, I mean, there just isn't way any, any way around it. And I feel like for people who haven't been following this, if you want to know why there's a, there's a hair on fire reaction to this. If you haven't been following every interstitial, you know, incremental bit of progress here, the important question here is not whether the Supreme Court is going to decide that Donald Trump and all presidents are immune from prosecution for things they commit, crimes they committed while they were president. I mean, it would be fully insane for them to actually side with Trump here, right? Remember, this is the case where Trump's lawyer was asked by Judge Florence Pan in the appeals court, are you telling me that this guy could, that, that a president could order the assassination of his political rivals and there could be no prosecution for that? Th that would be okay? We'd have to let that go? Not only for the duration of his presidency, but for the duration of his life, that would be okay. And Trump's lawyers are basically like, yeah. So the idea that they're going to side with him on immunity is unthinkable and also beside the point. The conclusion that we can arrive at now based on what they have done without having to wait for the ruling is that they are ensuring that Trump will not face trial. And when they inevitably rule that presidents aren't immune from prosecution after they leave office, what that will tell Donald Trump, if by then he is president, is that he can never leave the office of the presidency. Right. And if he is voted out in 2028, he cannot leave office and he is willing to he is, he is welcome to commit any crimes he wants to as long as he is still president in order to ignore the result of that election and stay in power for life, because otherwise he is going to go to prison when he gets out. That is the way this is going to go unless the country votes Trump out, votes for Biden and against Trump in November. Yeah, that, that point about the incentive structure produced by this is one that I hadn't even thought about, but it's, 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 it's very clearly correct. There, there's also, Lawrence, the point that Rachel made there, which I think is sort of interesting, you know, I was talking to people today or watching people's reaction to the news, and just the sort of, the court's hope that the kind of anodyne procedural nature means that the, it's, it, what they're doing is illegible. Mm -hmm. Right. That they can they can do this and like, oh, and then the news alert is like the court will take up the immunity argument. It's like, oh, well, that sounds reasonable. When are they going to do it? Oh, in April. OK, well, that that's part of the play here, that they're insulated um, from the backlash. Well, you know, I'm I hate to break the mood. If, if that's, Please if break that's the mood, buddy. Do. So I, my <laughs> hair isn't even warm. Uh, good. Good. On, I, on fire. Uh, but here's why. OK, here's why. And let me just work backwards, because I think the, the most important thing you said uh, in your opening remarks, is that this outcome should not be up to five members of the United States Supreme Court. It is really up to you, the voter, and that's a version of what Rachel was just saying, too. This, these votes, these four votes, because this piece of paper, all you need is four votes in the Supreme Court to turn out this piece of paper today. These four votes can be proven less important by the American people in the way they cast their own votes in right. November. I personally believe, having seen how well Joe Biden did in Michigan, having seen how badly uh, Donald Trump did in Michigan and in the other states, that Joe Biden is going to be reelected. And that's why I am not worried 
at all about the timetable. Because right. we have to remind the viewers the reason everyone's worried about the timetable is they're worried that Donald Trump becomes president on January right. 20th, and on the 21st, he kills both federal cases. Yes. But let's also remember, and I know this was just been talking about the federal case so far, Donald Trump is going to trial in New York City on March 25th on an election interference case for his first presidential Correct. election. That is also true. And the star witness is going to be a porn star, Stormy Daniels, whose testimony is going to be very well understood by every Trump voter out there. In fact, way more clearly understood than maybe most of the testimony in Jack Smith's case. So those things are going to happen. Let's talk about how each side won something in this in this decision by the court. And by Please. the way, these things are always one page, so I'm not going to be horrified by that. They are saying that the only question they're going to entertain is whether and to what extent does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during his tenure in office. Yep. That's the only question you're allowed to talk about in the Supreme Court. You know what that means? They just threw out half of Donald Trump's appeal, which was the double jeopardy part. Yes, correct. They threw it out, yep. and they threw it out right on that single piece of paper. So they're losing already. Jack Smith won here, too, because Jack Smith said, I want to go straight to the Supreme Court. They weren't asking to go to the Supreme Court. Trump's lawyers were asking to send this case back to the 11th Circuit. That's what they were actually asking for. Supreme Court said, no, we're going to take it. You're coming right here. Okay. But so they could have delayed it more than an extra month by sending it back to the circuit. So I don't, I don't disagree with you on, sort of, on the sort of channel of, is this do or die for the country? Because if he doesn't go to trial, he's going to win. I agree with you. Yeah, right? the, like, the, the, I agree that like the first day of the appeal. Yeah. He, if you find him guilty on this, he's going to go out in the courthouse steps and say, I'm appealing. By the way, he'll be standing on the courthouse steps probably sometime in April. Doing maybe, the same thing. Maybe, doing the same thing, maybe even before the Supreme Court rules. He'll be saying, I'm going to appeal the Stormy Daniels case. So for me, the, I think my, re, my reaction to it isn't necessarily about the implications for what it means for the electoral chances of mm -hmm. Donald Trump. It, it, it is a level of cravenness from the court that yes. they're moving at this pace <laughs> that I find deeply unnerving. What, you know what I mean? Like they, it, because yeah. the court, the thing about the court is they move fast and they want to move fast, they move slow and they want to move but slow. The, this particular court has never moved that fast. You know, when we look back at the Nixon court, the, the court that found against Nixon, we look at the Bush v. Gore court, but this court, you know, it's fast for them, right. you know, but I do agree, this is the most isolated court in the history yeah. of the court. So they think, this is going to appear to be fast. The, the, you just referenced the Nixon court, Rachel, and you have spent a lot of time on that period. Um, yeah. Kate, my wife, who's forgotten more about law than I'll ever know, and uh, who I, I basically just che cheat off for, for everything, um, pointed out to me today that in 74, I think it's U.S. v. Nixon, the, the, the court heard arguments in July, and they issued an opinion three weeks later. Mm -hmm. And her point about that was just that, look, that's the most similar case that we've had in our history is U.S. v. Nixon. And they, they, in terms of the actual opinion, moved quite quickly on that, and it was a unanimous opinion. Well, yeah, and, and the other, I mean, the other big, like, Nixon, if we're going to carry forward a thing from Nixon here, when you talk about the cravenness of the court, Chris, the cravenness of the court is evident in what they are doing with the pacing here, right? Like putting this off for seven weeks, sitting on it for two weeks for no reason, obviously pushing all of the cases that they can push, pushing them to the point where uh, Trump will be standing for election before any of us have heard the verdicts in any of those cases. Got it. It's the timing. But it's also the idea that the immunity thing is an open question, right? Is really presidential immunity an open question? Because what's the most famous pardon in American history? Gerald Ford pardoning Richard Nixon once he had resigned and was a former president. Why did Gerald Ford pardon Richard Nixon? Quote, as a result of certain acts or omissions occurring before his resignation as president, meaning as a result of stuff he did while president, quote, Richard Nixon has become liable to possible indictment and trial. Right. Whether or not he shall be so prosecuted depends on findings of the appropriate grand jury and the discretion of the uh, authorized prosecutor. So, the idea that this is an open question, that it might be that a former president can never be tried for something that he did because he was president when he did it, is disproven by a plain reading of American history and the whole justification for Richard Nixon being pardoned in the first place. So the idea that this has to be taken up is them saying the sky is green. Right. And I think even for the non-lawyers among us to be able to say, you know what, the sky is not green even on our worst day, this is BS. You 
you are doing this as a dilatory tactic to help your political uh, your political friend, your partisan patron. And for, for you to say that this is something that the court needs to decide because it's something that's unclear in the law is just flagrant, flagrant bullpucky. And they know it and they don't care that we know it. And that's disturbing about the future legitimacy of the court.